Welcome to our webinar today, Measuring Up to Our Ideals, a new vision for equitable quality measurement. I'm Debbie Mathias from the BUILD Initiative and the Director of the Early Childhood Quality Improvement Systems Network. When this information about these two papers came across my email, I found the approach and content very compelling. BUILD and the Trust for Learning are pleased to present the second in this series of webinars to explore the concepts and ideas of the authors. Today, we have colleagues registered from over 50 states and territories. When you registered, we asked what you hope to learn more about during the session. And many of you were curious about the relationship between measurement of quality and equity exactly the topic we're delving into today. I'd like to turn the session over to Chrisanne Gale, Chief Strategy and Policy Offer of the Trust for Learning to lay out some of the basics and get us started. But before I do, we're interested in your questions, ideas, and thoughts throughout the session. So please enter into the chat, chat box as something strikes you. If you have a resource or a strategy to contribute from your work, please share. If you have a question, please use the Q&A tab. This helps us locate questions quickly during the session in a, what we hope will be a busy chat box. So Chrisanne, I'd like to hand it over to you and thank you so much today. Thanks so much, Debbie. We are delighted to be partnering with BUILD on this webinar series. And we're excited that so many people joined us two weeks ago to discuss what equitable ideal learning environments look like in practice. We're excited to continue the conversation today to explore how to measure what matters most in early childhood settings and to think more deeply about how we measure equitably. As we know, children develop in the context of millions of interactions with their environments, caregivers, and communities. Trust for Learning uses the ideal learning principles framework to describe what high quality ideal learning environments look like in practice. As this graphic shows, these principles begin with a fundamental commitment to equity and include other elements that align closely with developmental research and studies of practice. For example, a focus on play as an essential element of young children's learning. The understanding that young children and adults learn through relationships and the importance of an intentionally designed learning environment to facilitate children's exploration, independence, and interaction. Importantly, we find that these principles can come to life in any setting, from family and center-based childcare to school-based settings. In our last session, we had a wonderful panel of experts discuss the research behind these principles and the equitable application of them. If you have not yet read it, the Trust for Learning's online brief explores the developmental neuroscience and implementation research aligned with each of the principles of ideal learning. We also have other resources available on our website that you may find useful, including our Ideal Learning Pathways report that profiles 11 high quality educator development models and provides recommendations for policymakers, early childhood leaders, and other audiences. Today, we are excited to share our most recent resource, a guide on measuring the quality of ideal learning environments, and to facilitate a conversation about this important topic. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Jennifer Brooks, Senior Impact Advisor and Consultant to Trust for Learning, who is a co-author of the guide and led the work group of experts whose thoughts are reflected in this report. Dr. Brooks works with philanthropic, government, and nonprofit groups to accelerate their impact through better use of data and evidence. She's held positions with the Gates Foundation, the National Governors Association, and also oversaw the Head Start Research Portfolio at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. 
She's gonna walk us through the contents of the guide and facilitate a conversation with three of the experts that contributed to it. So Jennifer, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Chrisanne. Hello, everybody. I hope you're doing well today. Um, I have the pleasure of giving you an overview of this guide that was really um, a work of multiple, multiple people, and we'll get we'll talk a little bit about the process in a minute. Um, but among those that helped contribute to it are the three experts we have here on the panel today. You'll be hearing from them right after I do an overview of the guide. So we've got Lydia Carlos, who is the Chief Program and People Officer at Ocelero and Shine Early Learning, Stephanie Curritan, who is a professor at the um, Boston University Wheelock College of Education and Human Development, as well as the director of the Center for the Ecology of Early Childhood Development, and Bridget Hamry, who is the co-founder and chief executive officer at Tishon. So first, I'm just going to give you a little of an overview of what the guide is, how we came to develop it, um, and then spend some time on what's inside of that guide. And then our, our panel of experts will reflect to you on what they think is important, how to apply it, um, and, and then we'll move to some questions. So first, just to say that this is a fairly easy to use, easy to use, easy to understand publication. It's, you know, it's not a big, long, dense product. It's a, it's a pretty easily, easily digested um, set of information. It represents the consensus thinking of a group of experts that we have been pulling together for about a year now. Um, they've come together in three separate meetings to talk about everything from what is most important for um, policymakers and program administrators to understand about measurement in the of quality in the early childhood space um, through to which measures exist that can tap into key elements of of the um, Trust for Learning Principles for Ideal Learning. The list of work group members is here on your screen. You can see these were pretty remarkable individuals. They've had experience that range from policy into practice, experts in dual language learners and experts in um, American Indian and Alaskan Native youth, um, experts in equity. They really were just a remarkable group of people who, who helped us drive this along. Um, what the guide does is provides us some expert insights into supporting holistic and equity driven approaches to measuring program quality and we'll talk about what that means um, in just a second. The guide itself is actually broken into two sections. The first section we call the fundamentals of quality measure measurement that really articulates a vision about the purpose and use of quality uh, quality measurement and it is very much rooted in principles of equity. So I think what's really unique about this guide is just the degree to which it tackles that question of how do we think about equity in early childhood measurement systems. Um, it's something that I think many people are thinking about, but it's coming at it from a holistic framework and also as it relates to not only multiple domains of children's development, but also multiple levels of the early childhood system, as you'll see as we walk through it. The second part of the guide talks about specific measurement in ish instruments aligned with the elements of each of the principles of ideal learning that that Chrisanne introduced, and if you were on the last webinar, you heard more about. Um, what I love about the principles of ideal learning is it captures, I think, what many of us who live and breathe and love early childhood think is important for kids, but it breaks us a little bit out of the traditional frameworks we use when we think about quality, which I think sometimes has kind of moved us into more, more narrow thinking. Um, so what we did as a group was then go through each of those elements and say, what should this look like? What measures exist? Um, and then we provide that in the, in the guide itself. So one thing I wanna hit on before, as we dive in, is that we really focus on quality measurement at multiple levels of a system in this report, particularly in the front end of it, um, making it clear that what constitutes quality in early childhood and early care and education actually runs across multiple levels. And sometimes we tend to think mostly about what's happening most proximal to children, what is in this purple quadrant of this visual. Um, 
children's learning experiences. So the direct relationships that are going on between educators and children, the relationships between children themselves, the curricula, the learning practices that are going on, um, things related to equity that deal with the degree to which children are getting equivalent experiences or the experiences and services they need, um, very much at the level of inter intersection between the adults and the caregivers and the children themselves. Um, at another level, if you pop down under it into the blue section, we think about organizational characteristics. So teachers don't, just like we think children are embedded in context, and we have to think about um, all the rings of support around children, the parents, the teachers, the communities, that is also true of teachers. They don't sit in a silo or on an island by themselves. They are embedded in organizations um, that themselves have an influence on what happens within those learning contexts. So thinking about things like family engagement strategies, the relationships between program staff, leadership, um, the racial and linguistic diversity of the staff. Does it reflect the children and the families that are being supported? Um, the access to supportive services, both both for families and for teachers. Um, so those parts of the system that are most closely connected to the teachers and the educators that really shape what's happening inside of an organization. Um, and here we have, as we'll go through, you'll see we have fewer measures, but there are some out there. Um, we also talked about the importance of quality at a system policy and systems level. Often the way we've kind of moved our discussions about quality measurement, it's been very much at this level of the organization and the children's learning experience with a big emphasis on the learning experience. Um, but one of the things points we make is that you cannot think about the, holistically about the quality of any given early care and education setting without thinking about the policies and systems that influence it, which of course will be very familiar to anybody who's been engaged with BUILD. Um, so this is everything from the professional development systems that exist, technical assistance systems, but also the distribution of funding and resources across communities. Have we been, are resources allocated in a way that the children who who stand to benefit the most are getting the most. Um, is it, are they also distributed in such a way as to actually support the elements of quality that we think are important? And obviously one of the big, big places we talk about here is the pay for workforce. So if you really wanna understand the quality of early care and education, you cannot treat organizations or teachers like they exist in a bubble. We have to be thinking about how these systems affect one another um, or these levels of the system, excuse me. We also thought it was important to talk about the community, call it the community context, both because, you know, who's available to work with children, what sorts of training resources are available, what the services systems look like is important, but also because it, it affects how, what sort of resources can be accessed in order to, per, to support high quality at a local level. It also affects, it's also indicative of who is being served. So we've got levels of trauma among the families here, right? What quality looks like may depend on who we're serving, um, at least some elements of quality, particularly when we're thinking about equity and we're thinking about whether the services are getting to the people who, who's, both need most need them and stand to benefit from them the most. So this concept, and you'll hear me talk about levels of the system and quality, this floats throughout the entirety of, of the guide that we're talking about. And, and we, we think it's critical to sort of move our thinking toward quality measurement that is more holistic in that way. So one of the key points that is made in the guide is really that we have to lead with equity. And this first bullet point here is probably the most critical for all of that, right? So the point central to the report is the belief that an early childhood program cannot be considered high quality without equity of access, equity of experiences, and equity of opportunity. So equity is not something that sits to the side of quality. Like we'll look at quality, but we'll also look at, at equity. What we're saying here is equity is a part of quality and you cannot have quality without equity. And this reinforces why those multiple levels of the system are important because 
equity of access and experiences and opportunities is not just within the control of any local early care and education program. We also make the point that equity must be incorporated into what is measured, how it's measured, and how the data are used. So equity isn't just, a, you know, we're going to have an indicator of what the staff look like, or um, we're going to have an indicator of, you know, the population that we're serving. It should be thought about at every element of, of measurement that, that's in the system, but in addition, that question of how it's measured is important, um, including the question of to what degree are we lifting up the voices of the people closest to what's happening in children's lives. So families and teachers, um, staff in general, like we, we sometimes tend to go to the observational measures, which are important, um, but it is also important to value what the voices of those who are most affected by this, um, by early care and education services have to say about the quality, because what they mean think of quality may be different, um, or there may be other elements such as the degree to which people feel like their pro the program they bring their child to is reflective of their culture. That can really affect how frequently they bring the child, whether they stay enrolled, things that really do affect impact um, and are, are important to understand. And then finally, we talk about the importance of thinking about equity and how data are used. And that's everything from thinking about what the ramifications of the use of measurement for more accountability are for different populations. Um, are we, are those communities that have less access to high, to um, teachers with bachelor's degrees, for example, are they being penalized when they probably are those who need the most resources um, simply because they don't have it? Also questioning, thinking about equity and how we're validating the measures we have. So overall, we give a set of fundamentals that we think are critical for anyone to understand in thinking about early childhood measurement, um, quality measurement. So one, of course, as we said, should fully incorporate equity issues, um, must include factors from all those levels of the early childhood system, particularly if what you're trying to do is capture quality as a whole for an organization. You cannot ignore all these other levels, especially in the context of high stakes use of measurement. Um, we also talk about the fact that no one measure can do everything. So you have to be thinking about multiple tools. You have to use the ones that are appropriate for the purpose. Um, but that means you need to be thinking about measurement strategies. It's not just we're going to have one measure and do everything and use it for all purposes. It's more of a strategic thinking about which measures are playing what role in your system um, and how to combine them in a way that doesn't overwhelm, doesn't confuse people. Measures should reflect all of what children need to thrive. So I, I mean, I think most early childhood people are full on in this one, but it's just a reminder that, you know, children are, are important. There are multiple domains of children's development that are critical. They're emotional, they're social, they're the physical development, um, as well as things like early literacy and early math. And of course, we all know those things are highly correlated in early childhood. And then finally, of course, it's important. There's a burden issues that we have to be acknowledging in measurement. And it is critical that in order to inform program improvement, measurement tools have to produce information that is use, usable. And that's not just a, a pretty report. People need, this is an area I think where in early childhood and actually most service systems I'm involved in where people get stuck. They have the data, but they don't know what to do with it. So it's really critical for measurement tools to be um, providing information that's translated into actionable steps. So in the report, we provide a couple of, um, we have two pages basically, you see a visual of it here that, that offer questions that policymakers can ask themselves and question that educators can ask themselves in order to determine what all of this means for how they design their own system. So you can see those questions in a pullout box here. Um, and they range from, you know, what is the vision of what we're trying to do here? Have we centered equity? Um, 
Are the training and data collection processes funded adequately so that we can actually cover what we think we are? Um, are systems adequately resourced to enable program improvement so this doesn't lead to data that doesn't actually inform um, improvements? And similarly, we have one for educators as well that also gets into questions of how well staff understand what's being measured and why. Um, that, that fear of punitive action on measurement can be really important important and so create uh, making sure you're being transparent about how measures are going to be used is important and then of course questions of burden the burden um, of administration that all was the first part of the report the second part of the report as i mentioned really starts to look at individual principles of from the ideal learning framework and asking these three questions you see up here what indicators would show that it's being implemented in practice so what would this look like what is the current state of measurement in the field in capturing those indicators and what are some of the principles of how existing measures address those elements um, so this is an example of one of the principles. This is the play is an essential element of young children. And you can see it's structured in those three ways. The first section really talks about, actually the first page really talks about what this would look like in practice. The second page starts with some reflection on measurement um, and then some ex illustrative examples of existing measures are in there. We have 29 measures in this guide that we go through. Um, they are not selected as sort of these are the only measures that exist or even the best necessarily they are just they're illustrative examples really of things that we feel do touch on that principle um and i think folks will really appreciate the the list because it's actually many many more measures than many of us have been exposed exposed to and of course new measures are coming online all the time to fill in some of the gaps um so just a comment about the measures, um, and then I'll be wrapping up and, and pulling in our panelists. So as I said, we've got 29 measurement instruments that align with one or more of the principles, um, and that they are illustrative, not exhaustive. They're not an endorsement by Trust for Learning. Um, we're just trying to uh, raise awareness of what's out there. And it includes some of the more commonly used classroom assessments um, and commonly used assessments, as well as tools that might be a little bit less familiar to people like the ELCO dual language learner supplement or the access that Stephanie um, is a co-author on is an author on despite the point we made about the importance of measuring all the levels of the system it one of the things we want to acknowledge is that most of the tools that exist really are at the classroom or immediate learning environments level there are some at the organizational level and the and the appendix that i'll show you in a minute actually gives you information about which levels are being measured by that tool but we really do have far fewer tools that look at the organization at a, as a whole and even fewer that look at broader systems and the question of how you know ideally these are connected to one another so it's not just here's a measure on systems and here's a measure on organizations and here's a measure on classrooms i think in order or or learning environments i should say it's not just classrooms but in order to connect them and and reduce burden we need tools that actually can tap at multiple levels so these are one these are areas for for future development this is just a picture of the appendix of the report. Um, so as I said, there's, you can see what, seven tools here, there's 29 of them in there and, and the pullout block box tells you what information we have in there about each of the tools. Um, so with that, I'm actually going to invite our panelists to join us and I'm going to ask a few questions of them and have them reflect on, on what they think is important about the report. Um, so welcome, Bridget, Stephanie, and uh, Lydia. Thank you guys for joining us today. So uh, my first question actually is for all three of you. Uh, I'm curious what you think is most important for the participants on this webinar to know about the guide. What do you think is really um, critical in this, in this piece? So Stephanie, I'm gonna start with you if that's okay. Hi, I am, I'm very, I was very excited to be part of this process. And one of the things that I would want people to sort of know and take away about this guide is that this, there's a wealth of measures that are out there. And 
I would want to encourage people to think creatively beyond our two most popular measures that are being used. And I think this is especially important when working with racially and ethnically and linguistically diverse groups of children and families. Some of the measures in the guide um, are specific to dual language learners or racially marginalized children. And those types of measures are incredibly important to use, um, perhaps in conjunction with the traditional measures or in, um, as an alternative to. And because it's important to use these measures because they provide detailed evidence about the experiences of children of color. So that's one of the things I would take away, to so use it as a resource in that way. That's great. Thank you. Um, Lydia. Hi, everybody. I'm glad to be here. Um, I would hope people understand that there was a very diverse group of um, leaders who we were able, we were privileged to contribute to this guide, but we are a few leaders in this field and there are many and we knew of a set of you know a, a set of um, tools and uh, resources that might be available to you there are more um, so that shouldn't overwhelm you it should i hope it just says <laughs> that um, we know some things we don't know everything and and that is what equity is about, like understanding what really meets the needs of your um, program and, and the, the children, families, staff, communities that um, who you are serving. Um, so to Stephanie's point, be, you know, being, um, being focused within what we were able to provide on which of those tools best might meet your needs, but also continuing to look beyond, as I know um, Trust for Learning will as well. Thank you, Lydia. Bridget. Sure. Um, well, first, I would just second uh, both of the comments, and particularly Stephanie's comment about the need for more measures. Um, and it's actually exciting to see how many more measures there are than there were 10 years ago. So, and I think to Lydia's point, there are more than re are represented here and uh, more I know under development. I think, you know, the other point I would make in that space, uh, again, is one Stephanie made, but just to double down on that, there is no singular measure that can measure everything that is important for every child. And that uh, creates a set of challenges to the people in the field doing the work to think about how to select the right measures for the, the right purpose and create sort of seamless experiences ultimately centering on the children, the families, the educators that we're serving. So um, recognizing both the advantage of seeing 27 <laughs> measures and also the challenge that that presents around how to make selections and use them. And, and then the other thing I would say beyond the what of what we measure, just the thing that I really appreciate about this guide is how it calls out, and you mentioned this, Jennifer, how important the how is so that we can have the very best measures in the world um, and they can be used well or not well. They can be used uh, to enhance equity or to detract from equity. Um, and so, you know, it is not just about selecting the tool, but making really conscious decisions about how the data are collected, who is collecting the data, how the data are shared, how frequently and quickly the data are shared. I mean, I can say from our experience, one of the things that we hear most about class and where class feels like it's working or not working for educators is how quickly they get feedback. And in far too many systems, they get observed and they never get feedback or they get feedback six months later and they only get a set of scores, which are, are entirely meaningless. So that point about making sure that our data are really relevant um, and provided back to the field um, and to the educators in the way that are most impactful, I think is something that's really emphasized here and, and so important. Thank you. I wonder if any of you want to reflect on each other's comments. Um, and Stephanie, I also wonder, or any of you actually, if you want to say a few words about the sort of how how the data are collected and what what that means, why that's important, how we think about that. I know I know you've been thinking about it a lot, Bridget, in terms of class. I know it's part of what's being thought about in access. Yeah. Okay. So I I have to say that. Um, I was fortunate enough when we were creating access to think about access being collected and scored via video. So even before COVID hit, right, we were sort of thinking about in this space. And um, one of the reasons why for access, we 
feel adamant that um, it be collected being video via video is that the intention of the access measure was always to provide professional development and supports to teachers. And we know from the My Teaching Partner work that the best way to get teachers to change is by being able to show them themselves in practice. And that's even more important when we're looking at issues that might be related to bias, because most people are not consciously walking around in the world knowingly engaging in bias acts. Most of the, most, the vast majority of the world does not operate like that. And um, so it's important to, um, to be able to provide that evidence so that people can see the window into themselves and be given the opportunity to self-correct. And I would add another reason that video um, can be so useful. It also supports co-scoring in a way that is scalable and more um, affordable. And so you can look at, do we have bias in how we are rating folks based on the race, ethnicity, gender, um, any of those identities that we might hold, you know, like, are we rating differently because of who we are and, and what we're bringing? Um, and is that happening consistently to disproportionately um, to Im negatively impact some of our programs or our staff. Um, so video is definitely a very powerful tool in advancing equity. One other example I'd add that I think um, we, at least in our work, I think we didn't hear a lot of attention to until the past few years, which I think is so important is who are the observers. So especially for sort of larger state systems or the Office of Head Start, who actually the office has been paying attention to this, but um, you know, what we know is our observer pool for class is too white. You know, the, the typical observer is a 50 year old white woman, right? And so even with lots of training and experience, how well are they able to go into a very diverse setting and make a set of ratings that are, you know, no one can be totally unbiased, but that are as unbiased as possible. So I think paying attention to the who and really systematically thinking about how we recruit retain and train a really diverse set of observers is something that we're focused on. And I think, you know, is relevant to, to any of the tools that would be used here. Thank you, thank you. So one of our, one of our key fundamentals is that um, information should be useful. Um, one of the things I'm curious if you'd be willing to talk about is how, um, how this guide can be made actionable for, for different people um, across the early learning system. So I think, Lydia, I'm gonna start with you if that's okay, if you would mind, and of course you all should be, feel free to comment on all of them, but I'm gonna start with you, Lydia, if you can talk about what, how you think program leaders might use this guide. Sure, um, information should be useful. Um, it should also be usable. Um, and the useful piece of that information can be useful for informing um, what is happening with children and educators, what is happening between children. It could also be useful for talking about what's happening in the environment. Um, but it's also useful, quite frankly, to keep the lights on and the doors open because of licensing requirements. So, uh, you know, it can be useful in many different ways. But if we want to maximize its use, then we would focus um, really heavily on how you can do both and. Um, so if we know we need to adhere to or master the QRIS, the quality rating improvement systems, um, have we done the work with our with our educators, with our families, with um, folks who help us engage with families and our leaders to look at which elements of our QRIS are useful for which of those different elements. So some will be useful for teacher-child interactions, some will be useful for informing environments and so on. Um, and some will just be, we can't really figure out why it's there, but we know we have to do it. Um, and I think when you're able to be honest with all of the stakeholders, 
about like we we're doing some of this be because we would do it whether we needed to do it for this QRIS or not. And some of these things we just have to do. Um, we hope some policymakers will be listening so they can take those things that we know don't matter off of those tools. But until they do, as a program leader, me understanding which elements are most useful for um, the, the work that the staff and leaders of our organization need to fulfill is really important, but them understanding it is more important. So I think that is like a great first step is just being able to articulate why you are using certain data, what you hope to achieve with each of those um, data tools. Um, in the guide there, it, we focused on starting with your vision, like what would be different, better, enhanced for children, families, communities, if we achieved what we think is quality in our programs. And then taking a step back and figuring out where we really are. So how far away from our from our ideal learning are we? And, and what are some steps that can take us to get there? And it's not one big journey. You can split those up. So in the guide, we have organizational characteristics, community context, um, so like in children's learning experiences. So you might just take one of those areas and focus or have a group, a team focus on one of those while another team is focusing on children's learning experiences. Um, and then coming back with incremental goals, going to the measurement tools that are provided in the guide to support, to support you in um, how what how do you look at quality in each of the areas that you've identified if a tool doesn't exist or if just a small piece of a tool is really you know or um you can pull out some pieces from a tool that would get you the some of the information you need how can you be consistent in looking at those data analyzing those data figuring out how your bias leads you to look at and interpret those data. Um, where, where are you more prone to look? Who are you blaming? Are you sharing accountability for the outcomes of those data? And, um, and I think something, one more thing that I need to go back to, and then I will be quiet, um, is starting when you create that vision, ensuring that all the people who are impacted are at the table. So it should be a shared vision of quality. So you have your teachers there, you have your family engagement folks there, you have your families there saying what, what is it that they want to see for themselves and their children as a result of being engaged in your program. And then you build out your solutions, your data solutions, evaluation solutions from that. Thank you, Lydia. And you never have to be quiet. I'm always fascinated. Everything you say is so helpful. Um, how about Bridget, would you be willing to speak about, you know, policymakers, state administrators, what advice you might have for them about the use of the guide? Sure. Well, I mean, I think one thing I would point out that I, one of the things I really appreciate about the ideal learning principles in themselves is how hard the team worked to create a set of principles that um, that many different program models could see themselves in. Now, everyone's going to agree or disagree with the specific wording of a particular item, right? But I think the team sort of at the base of those principles worked really hard. And I think that's really helpful to state leaders because they're working across systems, lots of different curriculum, lots of different perspectives. Um, and so I think that that sort of central grounding makes this report relevant really across a lot of different contexts, which I think is really important. Um, and, and I also think it's important just to, and Lydia talked about this a little bit, just the, the very first question, right, the policymakers need to ask themselves is why am I measuring anything, right? And I, I think 
there are times when measurement makes sense. There are times when measurement doesn't make sense. But but certainly, I think from a broad policy perspective, um, the value of measurement, as if our goal is obviously to continue to support and improve the quality of experiences that children are having in classrooms. And there's lots of ways that we can do that. Um, but what I, I appreciate this guide does is to say, if you really want to systematically at scale improve children's experiences um, in terms of like what access measures, the sort of equitable distribution of children's uh, experiences of interactions, then having a measure provides a window that you're just never gonna get to. It would not be the same, and I would be curious about Stephanie's perspective on this, just to offer teachers PD without having something that allows you to track and understand are teachers actually making that progress. So I think um, having a tool like this, a report like this that helps ground us in, um, in you know, a, a common framework for understanding what we're trying to shoot for, and then uh, a real grounding in, and again, the why of the measurement. Um, and I would, you quickly uh, walked through the, that table, Jen, but I do think that like, those tables of sort of questions for policymakers are really helpful as a guide. Um, if I was leading a state, I would really want to take that out across the field. And I think as somebody in the chat said, this is not just a conversation to be had in state houses, um, but conversations that you really wanna have with the community about what do we value and what are we looking for? And then using this tool to help select measures that can be used um, to help assess that, that progress. Thank you, Stephanie. I I'd like to ask you what you think the implications are for researchers, um, but I'm also wondering if you want to reflect on anything that uh, Lydia or Bridget had to say. So no, I think they said it well. I think they um, they made the all the key points in an awesome way. Um, I did want to talk about research. I'm really excited to be able to do that, and I think that there's a couple of things that this report, the way that I think the report will help the field, particularly in terms of research. And first and foremost is one of the most important sort of research questions that it raises is that it has led us to understand that we have an opportunity to reconceptualize our definition of quality, right? And to, to think carefully about how we're measuring that reconceptualization. And it has allowed us to see and, and hopefully inspire researchers to create new measures that look at quality in a different way and how these new measures might be able to fill, fill existing gaps. Um, I think the second thing about research is that I think the guy can push research questions um, such as which measures work best for which children and in which types of programs. And this type of work is critically important, especially as we look at how quality might be related to child outcomes. So um, for example, with access measure and some of our studies, we found that there's actually interactions between um, these racially racial equity dimensions of quality and the percentage of racially and ethnically diverse children in the classroom. So we have to understand that quality in one space um, might look different and quality in another space, and it might have different outcomes you know, for different children. I think um, another question um, that I think could be explored is um, what are the background characteristics of teachers and their students in relation to these different types of quality measures? So for example, we've we found in some of our work that all teachers, regardless of their race and ethnicity, engage in these sort of quality behaviors that's more aligned with racial equity when they're teaching more children of color. And so this was like super exciting because it shows that all teachers really can be culturally responsive and anti-bias when they're working with kids of color. And they can, I just truly believe they can do it when they're given the professional supports and learning communities that, um, that they need to do that. And so it's just awesome to know that. I think another question that I'm really interested in too is how technology can help us in investigating quality, particularly like AI. I'm just so fascinated by AI and um, how we can think about how computers and cameras even might be able to help us not only gather this information, but also analyze this information about quality. And then the last thing I was gonna say about research is that I think a research issue that relates directly back to policy 
is whether public and private funders might actually be interested in creating some type of combined version of quality measures that could be used across a variety of different programs. And especially those programs serving children of color and children who are linguistically diverse. And there, because as Bridget had said earlier, there's no one measure that can fit all the needs of our field. However, I think with the proper investment and, um, and leadership, policymakers can work on creating incentives for people, for developers to really work together in order to create some combined version that will measure quality in developmentally appropriate manners, that's also grounded in linguistic diversity and racial equity. And I just really think that it is my heart that we can start to think about um, to think about that, and that and that as researchers we can be incentivized to sort of do that work together. What can I add? Uh, just something to that. So I think one challenge I might give to my my um, research the research part of my brain, which I I keep alive, but is now informed by a sort of deep commitment and engagement in the field, which is just. Some of these measures, including class, were really developed and designed initially for a sort of research purpose and have then evolved to serve a, a much broader purpose. And I think the next generation of measures um, has the opportunity to really be designed, not even just for a CQI purpose, but for, for how people actually use them. Um, and that, you know, I think an example of a trade-off, right, that, that and I, I point that out because I think researchers sometimes have to make trade-offs. So I'll give it a very explicit example, which is, you know, we designed class with six different age levels, infant, toddler, pre-K, K3, upper elementary and secondary, because we thought that was important to really, really describe what was most important. But that age level differentiation creates huge challenges um, for systems in terms of cost and accessibility. So I think that's just an example, but one that I expect some of these measures that were designed really for practice purpose offer value, even sometimes if they don't have as rigorous sort of high quality validation data. And so I think that's just a tension that the field is going to need to live with as we, especially as we work to sort of rapidly evolve uh, new and innovative measures. Yeah, I think that point is critical, Bridget. I think, you know, if, when we design measures for research, we go really, we often go very deep in a small number of things, right? Because we're studying that. And in order to study it, to understand it, to understand how to improve it, um, we have to go deep into it, but it makes it difficult then to think about in a holistic framework, how you take, you know, 10 tools that were all designed to do something different and put them together when each one of them is so burdensome that nobody has time to do all those things. So that's such a critical, such a critical question or a point, sorry. Um, so one question I'd like, to, well, one of the questions we had when we were designing this was the question about home-based settings and whether there is, are differential implications of this guide when you're thinking about home-based settings. Is it equally applicable? What we say, is it equally applicable to infants, toddlers, to home-based, to all different kinds of settings? Um, and, and whether you have any thoughts on that. So I'll just say a little bit, and I think this reflects back on exactly what Bridget was just saying. Um, it's hard to try to create like one measure that is going to span across these um, different age groups. However, in the real world, that is what is needed. And so, um, so I think that we do have some things um, that are um, that are out there that can do that. But I just still feel as though we really need to. Um, to be able to come together in a meaningful way with you know a lot of a lot of these stakeholders and creators like really being able to come together in a meaningful way to with practitioners like um, and leaders like Lydia said and really think about how do we sort of take all of our knowledge for, that we've been learning across the years and really design something this next generation of measures that is really something that can be used in practice knowing that there's varieties of, um, of age groups, varieties of settings, et cetera, and sort of like really start out with that point versus, um, versus coming from like this research world, like we said, where we can get so stuck in like developmental periods. 
Thank you. We have a couple of questions in the Q&A box. So I'm going to bring these up to the group. So first, there was somebody who asked about the part of this, the sort of different levels of the system, that circle that I had with the pie pieces, um, about the community level and whether there are quality measurement tools that really take a strength-based approach to community. Um, this was something I think that came up in our discussions in terms of the importance of thinking about the community context. I'm wondering what you guys think about what that means in terms of measurement. Are there tools out there? Is this just more standardized or sort of other tools we have that might reflect on what's happening in a community or what's available in a community? You're going to test my uh, remembrance, Jennifer, of did we find any measures uh, that measured community that we sort of crosswalked to that uh, part of it? Do you recall? No. I mean, that, that's what I sort of recall our, you know, our reflections being in conversations is that this is such a critical element and yet one that hasn't, I, don't, I mean, we don't have measures of it in part because I don't know that people have done a great job of conceptualizing what it is and how we all can say and recognize that it's important, but before we have a measure, we need to really understand the constructs that, that are important to measure. And um, I think maybe it's more of anything, a call out to, to do the work, that sort of more qualitative work to first understand how we might ensure that we're, uh, that we're assessing the elements of the community that are most important. I agree. I know there are, you know, the community assessments that happen in Head Start programs, in um, in the community action programs um, that I've worked with historically as well. Um, that those approaches, um, not necessarily tools, but the sets of questions and the sets of um, uh, themes that they are looking for often seem to come from a deficit perspective. Um, the answers can only be as good as the questions that are being asked. And if questions start from a deficit um, perspective, assuming community deficits, then it's hard to really get at what the assets are within what the assets are, who the assets are um, within the communities. Um, so I would just say even for the tools that we use and approaches that we use now, there is definitely um, ample opportunity to focus on equity and strengths based um, assessment there. I can give like, uh, you know, I think this goes back to me also a little bit to the systems design piece. One of my um, favorite examples that I've heard of as people use class is comes from Rapides Parish in Louisiana. Um, and it was, you know, the question of community here I would cite is how much do, does a community um, what is our what is our community, especially in early childhood? So are we talking about when we say community, are we only thinking about you know state funded pre-K? Or are we really working to change the vision, um, especially of people working in schools to understand that all of these kids are our kids, all of these educators are educators across systems? And I think because Louisiana really worked to create these, um, cross sort of family child care, child care, Head Start, and state pre-K communities, it allowed a superintendent of a, of a school system to say, you know, I actually have, I'm sitting on a pot of money, and I recognize what I would typically do is use this money for PD for my state-funded preschool teachers, but when he looked at their data and saw, you know, it was all of the four-year-olds were sitting across the parish in lots of different communities, and he really recognized he needed to distribute um, that those dollars more equitably to serve the children who needed it most and the educators who needed the support the most. So I think the sort of, you know, elements of community are vast, uh, but this, this uh, challenge and something I think me measures in the space could help us do is how do we redefine um, who the community is and center again on the children and educators and families as opposed to just the systems that we happen to be sitting on top of. Such great points. Um, there was a question earlier in the chat, I'm, I'm trying to find it, um, that says, 
Um, if the standards in a QRIS are chosen solely or primarily on the basis of research slash evidence slash established best practice, would that be limiting from the perspective of equity? And if yes, can you speak to how? I'm wondering if you guys want to take that question in terms of if we're working from existing research and defining what quality is and how to measure it, what are the implications of that for from an equity perspective? I mean, I'll take a stab, but I have to say, Stephanie and I have had this conversation, right? Um, you know, I mean, I think as we were, you know, some of you may know, we just are launching the second edition of class. And as we sort of thought about how we wanted to approach it, one of the conversations that we've had with a, a variety of leaders, uh, including Stephanie, is sort of on what basis is our definition of quality defined? Sort of who are the theorists and researchers who we're using to generate our perspectives. Um, and, um, and, you know, I think, at, you know, we with second edition, I hopefully are better at least acknowledging the, the sort of biases that we bring to that. But I think it's a great point. And I think there's a sort of pretty nascent, um, but important new field of theorizing about what children's development looks like in much more diverse and equitable contexts that um, you know, I'm sure Stephanie could speak to you much better than I as informing, you know, the basis of the measure. So I think it's a great question. So I think Bridget said it well, um, and I think, you know, a lot of my work, my colleagues work, um, Tanya Durden, we have talked about raising this um, issue like quality for whom, you know, whose definition of quality, and we've been repeatedly saying this. And, um, and I think if I'm not mistaken, the Foundation for Child Development just did a webinar series a couple of weeks ago where the whole purpose of that series was to highlight Black scholars. So Black developmental scholars, because what we, yeah, we did a, um, a session for them, I guess, in the fall. And one of the things that came out of our session um, with them is sort of a lot of our are, I'm a researcher, so I'm talking from the researcher perspective, but a lot of the researchers don't even know theorists beyond sort of the classic white male theorists, right? And so when it comes to sort of thinking about how children develop, how they grow, what they need, it's just such a um, tunnel, tunnel vision. So I think that there is um, an opportunity, hopefully like in this new generation of measures where we will be able to take an interdisciplinary approach of around sort of the literature, a sort of more collective approach in terms of who's at that table to talk about what quality is and, and then move forward with a new vision of what quality is. I wonder if the, um, and this is outside, outside of the scope of this talk, but I think important to what Stephanie is, um, was just sharing is like, if, the folks who are the gatekeepers to publications, which is what gets you, you know, elevated as a scholar or a theorist, have biases. If the criteria for representation there is biased, like how does that impact? Um, and so where are the places where folks in the chat asking these questions can go to know that they will find diverse research, that they will find um, research in theory that has been evaluated from a lens of equity. One other um, point I might make is that I think, and, and Stephanie, Lydia could challenge me, I think that the point is not that there is not, there are not things that are important for all children, relationships. We know that relationships are important for all children. I think there is a lot of work to do to define what those really look like and how they show up. Uh, and that becomes really important in our, in our measurement work. And I would go back a little bit to the point about how, because ultimately these measures, at least as they've been currently designed, are words on a page, right? And so, uh, you know, the, a lot of the how is about how are we actually training people to know and understand these um, things. So I can talk about relationships, but I think one of the things we've been working hard to do is make sure that we have video exemplars that are very diverse and show what those relationships look like and show the variations in the kind of behaviors that you might see across a variety of contexts. So 
Um, I think, you know, we need more and different measures that are measuring unique things and our measures that are more global need to do work to make sure we're providing um, a much more inclusive and diverse understanding of what these various elements might look like across the, you know, incredible diversity of programs that are serving our young children and families. So I'm going to put you guys on the spot a bit, which I've kind of been doing the whole time, but, <laughs> and ask you like, so imagine you are um, a state policymaker and or a local, you know, someone who runs a program at a local level, um, and you wanted to follow the guidance of this, of this, this document, even though a lot, of, I think what we're saying is a lot of this isn't ready yet, right? Doesn't exist yet. It's complicated. We should have multiple measures, but then how do you link them together? Um, are, you know, is there like one piece of advice you would give them in the immediate for how to get started? I would say my piece of advice is starting with, um, even before you open up the guide, think starting with understanding who your community is like who, who who are the children you're serving who are the families what is the program like what are the program needs so that you know that sort of you know about yourself as an entity and then you open up this guide and you use the guide and you are intentional when you use the guide to try to figure out um what is the information in this guide that applies to me and to my you know center and our needs you know etc so that's the first step that i would tell them you know to do is that the is that the answer lies within yourself the first step is in your look at know yourself i also think that you know sometimes uh if people have been introduced to measures through these large state systems it can seem very daunting um or very different from i think what this guide is recommending which is you know, there's a lot of measures here that could be explored and used in, you know, much simpler. Um, uh, I don't know if simple is the right word, but, um, you know, used at, at just a programmatic level, right? So the state might require you to use class or use Eckers or use something else. But I think the point here is that, and I think some of the states, some states are really moving in this direction of supporting, you know, we might collect some data on some of these larger measures, but we also really want to encourage programs to choose the measures that make the most sense for them um, and demonstrate the ways that, um, we, that it, what, what does it show about your program? And then what does that say about what you need to do to improve? So I think, um, you know, start with a few classrooms, try these things out, see how people respond. Um, and I think that can uh, make some of these tasks easier than, and less overwhelming. I think going back to the policymakers um, in particular, thinking about um, having them think about themselves, but not too deeply to where they are applying their biases about what is best to what should be measured for um, other communities. Um, and I think uh, listening to the community, so they're looking at the community, they're seeing um, the data that are collected already, but also just being in community with their community. So building relationships, finding out like where are those strengths in the communities that have been most marginalized um, and how can we build from those to support our educational programs since that's what you know that's what we are focused on here you know how can the community strengths add value to the educational context in those communities Thank you. And I'm going to pose one more question, and then I think we're going to hand it over to Debbie to wrap us up. So one question I'm seeing sort of filtered through multiple questions or comments in the chat is sort of what is the role of local empowerment sort of in this, right? Both from a, in terms of identifying what quality means to them um, in thinking about what they want to measure. And then I'm going to throw in their self-assessment, right? Like, which may be with a tool that isn't locally designed, but, you know, how do we um, engage more local empowerment in there? And then is there risks? Like if local communities are all defining quality for themselves, what does that mean? Um, so I'm wondering if you guys want to jump in on that one. Well, I can give a specific sort of research example of this. Um, in Louisiana, when they first designed the system, one of the things that they decided to do, which when they told 
myself and, and Bob Pianta were like, that seems like a really bad idea was they designed it locally. So the local, so most of the Louisiana uh, data is collected uh, locally. And we were concerned as researchers about the reliability of the data, but there was a great research study that asked the question, <laughs> Uh, how does the reliability and validity compare when collected locally uh, versus when we collected it using our sort of UVA trained folks? And actually, the validity, the correlation to child outcomes was equal with the local um, as compared to the research. Um, and we've seen time and time again the value of that local. So in Louisiana, I would say, you know, by and large, as compared to many other states, folks don't feel like this is a system that is being pushed down upon them because they have been given the resources and the capacity to use that tool at a local level. So I think it is sort of challenging some of our assumptions around um, around what it means to do things locally. And I, and I see more and more sort of state systems valuing that um, and, and seeing the, the sort of payoff that you get when you really believe in and empower the local communities, which, which we should all do. And more QRI, QRI systems are adding in support for self-assessment um, from the programs themselves so that they understand the tools, they understand how they are being measured, they should have a pretty good idea of how they are going to score if or be rated if they are empowered to um, understand that tool and be able to use it for themselves. And if and it goes back to um, what I was trying to share earlier around understanding which elements of the tool are useful for which stakeholders in your school school or program community right or family child care community right if is this what i need to be thinking about with my families this is what i need to be thinking about as a program owner this is what i need to be thinking about for um, teacher child interactions and then moving from there when the writer comes in, they're telling you things that you already know. Great. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to just take a second to thank the panelists. You can all see it's really easy to produce a great report when you've got a brain trust like this. And um, these are just a few of the remarkable people we had in this work group. Um, and thank you to the audience for joining us. I am going to pass it back over to Debbie to wrap us up. I'd like to concur with the thank you to this terrific panel um, and the engagement. We'd like to thank our participants for coming to the session today and sharing your ideas, comments, and questions. We have a slide with resources that were highlighted during this session, and we will be adding, as a last slide, Jonathan helps us do this, um, the resources that were shared uh, by our participants during the session to a final slide in the presentation. Build would also like to encourage you to, um, for folks to sign up for the NCIT Exchange. It's a great um, way to reach out to colleagues, to get information, to um, share ideas, and we would like to know that there are slides in this deck that will give you the directions about how to do that. And um, I have my contact information here. If you have specific follow-up ideas or questions you'd like to reach out, that's great. Um, but again, just wonderful time with our panelists today. And thank you so much for your time and efforts and putting this presentation and discussion really together. Thank you, everyone.